I do uh, want to introduce Mike. Um, when he went to the Philly club and all of a sudden they needed a new newsletter editor. Wow. What a great newsletter. It, it came out. And then all of a sudden the website, uh, really, really impressive. And I said, got to meet this guy. And next thing we know, we're talking and, uh, he said he'd do a presentation. He joined the club, but a little bit of background. He's a retired banker. He moved to Doylestown, PA, a couple of years ago to be near the family. He collects U.S. pre-1990 uh, front to back and is attempting to complete a stamp from every country album. His primary collecting passion, however, is postal history with an emphasis on the social history of covers in his collection. He enjoys researching covers and uh, posting his findings to his blog. He also edits the Greater Philly uh, Stamp Club a newsletter and manages the website. And I'll say that both of these won nice awards in the uh, the competition uh, for the um, Star Route Awards uh, for 2023. So congratulations, Mike. And how is your album coming for Stamp for Every Country? Is that you know, it's it's coming along. Actually, I don't know if Kathy's on the on on the call tonight, but uh, one of your one of your members. Uh, uh, hang on, here we just uh, things just kind of went went. Uh, there we go. We're back. Sorry about that. Just, my screen just went nuts for a second and then came back. But she uh, she provided me uh, a set of uh, stamps from from India that, that her husband had collected. He passed away recently, and I actually I filled up most it, of right? my yep uh -huh. filled up most of my Indian state uh, blanks from from that particular book. And I've got a whole bunch that that she just said keep. So if anyone's interested in that, let me know. I'm happy to to forward the box on to you. And you can go through the list. So wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, anytime you want to start uh, sharing then and share your screen and if the rest okay. could, uh, could mute. And now, how do you want questions during or after or does it matter? Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. We, we can take them, take them during. That would be fine, too. So, OK, very good. There we go. Let's we'll see if I my screen should be. Why is my screen not sharing here? Let's see. Can you see my screen now? <laughs> yes. Okay, we can good. now, Mike. Thank you. Good. There we go. I don't know what I did wrong. So again, thanks for that introduction, Paul. Um, what I want to talk about tonight is a tour of U.S. collecting possibilities based on ad covers. Um, I don't, didn't have a big collection of ad covers. I would pick up uh, advertising covers here and there or something would, would catch my, my fancy. And then about a year ago, I acquired a box of uh, several hundred covers at an auction. And going through that, there were a whole set of, of, of advertising covers, some that were interesting, some that were not so interesting. And I started to look at the at the stamps on the covers, started to look at the cancellations, other markings. And I thought, you know, this is pretty fascinating if you could actually put together a presentation that demonstrates the range of collecting possibilities uh, around U.S. stamps uh, based on, uh, on advertising covers. So that's what this presentation is all about. Um, I don't have a lot of uh, breaking information here. I think it's really a tour of the Scott catalog for the most part. Uh, so I really view this uh, presentation as sort of targeted for novice and intermediate collectors who really want to expand their collecting interests. Maybe they're they're stuck collecting uh, individual stamps and they want to want to expand out from that. So hopefully this gives them uh, something something to build on. And everything that I'm going to show here tonight I actually have in, have in my my collection. So to, to be quick about the uh, description of advertising covers or what some people refer to as commercial postal history, it's really any cover that's got some sort of printed advertising on it. Today, we'd, we, we'd call it junk mail. Uh, corner cards are one example of that, usually something more than, than just a return address. Uh, cameos have some sort of embossment that I'll show you in a, in a, few, in a few minutes. Advertising co collars are another example where the stamp is actually framed uh, by, by an image on the cover itself. And then illustrated covers are really the, the pinnacle, uh, highly, highly illustrated, oftentimes in color. And it seems like it was really the late 19th century, early 20th century when these were in, in their heyday. Um, why collect ad covers just by themselves? Uh, well, several reasons. I mean, historical interest. Uh, they really provide some really great fodder if you're interested in doing a, a background research on, on companies, visual appeal, uh, appealing, as well as just the tie-ins for, for top correct collectors. And by and large, they are very affordable. Uh, you know, there's, there's some that, that can be quite pricey, but you can sign, find some very nice covers at very reasonable prices. So I'm going to give you just a few examples of just sort of what you can do with ad covers. This slide here just shows two covers. Uh, 
that uh, come from the uh, the early part um, uh, of the history of Milwaukee. Uh, both these businesses were formed in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, A.R. Ween's Brush Company, uh, you know, opened in, in the 1900s, and by the mid 1960s, it was out of business. You, you find nothing, nothing left of that company. At the other extreme, you've got something like the Hotel Fister, which was organized around this the same time. Uh, it has been in business ever since. It's been a AAA uh, uh, diamond hotel. It's a great place to stay if you get a chance to go to Milwaukee. There's been an addition to it, but the uh, the building that's pictured on this particular ad cover remains at the core of the hotel. Uh, interesting uh, aside on that, if you see at the at the bottom of the hotel, it says absolutely fireproof. You know, after the uh, great fire of Chicago in 1871, a lot of hotels uh, would advertise themselves as being absolutely fireproof. And they would base it on the fact that the, that the buildings are made out of brick or they were made out of um, concrete. And that held true until I think sometime in the late 1940s, there was a hotel in New York City that actually advertised itself as absolutely fireproof. Uh, they forgot the fact that an awful lot of wood is auctioned those buildings as well. And there was a terrible fire in the hotel. And some 60 people died. Uh, and obviously, hotels have become much safer, but that was a big selling point at the turn of the century. Um, the other thing that about ad covers I mentioned is just visual appealing. And this is a pretty striking example from, from Minneapolis right around the turn of the century. Uh, international stock food company, you know, fully illustrated uh, front and back in, in bright colors, lots of information. This one is franked with, uh, with a pre-cancel stamp, you know, one example of a, of a, of a collection that, that you can create. There's a, there's a U.S. pre-cancel society, uh, very affordable collecting interest and fascinating to, to look for collections of stamps from, from various cities and states. And there's all sorts of, uh, of different uh, pre-cancel types. And if you go back into the, into the late 1900s uh, or late 1800s, I should say. So it's so really a fascinating uh, subject to collect. Uh, topical collectors, I mean, take, take your pick. Uh, whatever your interest is, I'm sure you can find an advertising cover that, that'll pick your interest. Uh, this particular uh, card, the postcard actually, I really enjoy because everything about this is advertising. You know, uh, the, the Graf Zeppelin issues and from, from, from 1930, those were effectively ads for, for the Graf, uh, Graf Zeppelin 1930 uh, Europe Pan America trip. And most of the money uh, raised from the sale of these stamps went to the Graf, uh, Graf Zeppelin company. Uh, the cancellation on the stamp, you know, register or ensure value mail, you know, right up the uh, post office's alley to try to get people to use those those services. And if you go to the back of the card, um, this is this is really an ad for Northwest Airlines, which is now part of, uh, of Delta Airlines, uh, merged back in uh, in 2010, I believe. And this particular photo of of, of Milwaukee aerial view. I grew up in the city and uh, most of those buildings continue to stand. And the most prominent one there is the Milwaukee City Hall, which is this wonderful building that was built in the late 1800s. Uh, for, for many years, it was the tallest building in Milwaukee itself. So it's kind of fun to, to take a look at this car from the late 20s, early 30s, and be able to match all those buildings that remain in the city itself. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned with ad coverage, really opening up rich research possibilities. and. You know, you can pick any one of these cards and go online and just find uh, a ton of information. You know, the, the, the Graf Zeppelin's uh, journey across the ocean was huge news back in, back in 1930. And you can find lots of newspaper stories. And in fact, the New York Times uh, logged uh, every day of, of the Graf Zeppelin's trip uh, from, from Germany to, to Spain, to, to South America, Cuba, and then up the East Coast to, to New York City. Um, and then, it, of course, the postal bulletins are an incredibly rich source of information if you're trying to find out, you know, stamp uh, postage usages, uh, regulations, etc. And this particular postal bulletin, which, of course, you can't read by looking at the screen, is from, uh, from early April of 1930. And it lays out all of the, uh, the usages for the, for the graph uh, Zeppelin stamps itself. So, again, just points to the kind of the research opportunities that one can do. And I'll, I'll touch a little bit more on those as I go through the rest of the slides here. So, really, what I, what I want to spend the rest of the, uh, the, the, the presentation going through are all these philatelic features that, that you can find on, on advertising cards. And you can pretty much just do a tour of the Scott catalog by going through ad cards, uh, ad covers. So I'll give a, a, a very, one example of, of a cover from the Stampless era. 
uh, talk about some highlights in early post office history uh, in, in the 19th century. Uh, described what I just what, what I would describe as three workhorse stamps from the 19th century. These are stamps that were uh, each issued in excess of a billion, and really became very common stamps from 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 that period of time. Touch on some other classes of uh, of mail other than first class. Uh, a couple of stamped envelopes. I'll go through postal cards and postcards. Uh, in case postage stamps, like a one cover from the Confederate States. And then these, these other examples, I'll just highlight here and there as I go through the presentation. I already mentioned the, the, uh, the pre-cancels. So with that, uh, maybe I'll stop a minute and see if anyone has any questions or comments at this point, and then I'll jump into the rest of the covers. Yeah, all right. So stampless era. I've got one stampless cover in my collection that has an ad on it. And this is a corner card. It's, it's a weekly struck cameo. It's, <laughs> uh, it's a cover that I would date from between 1847 and 1851 based on the, uh, the amount of postage. So it's a free, a five cent uh, prepaid letter rate on here. And that particular New York postmark there was only used between 1847 and 1851. So as you might know, uh, the U.S. The, the first U.S. postage stamps were issued in 1847. They were preceded by the Postmaster Provisionals in 1845. But stamps were not required to be used on covers in a prepaid uh, fashion until 1856. So you will find stampless envelopes anywhere, the U.S. stampless envelopes anywhere from 1856 back in time. So as I mentioned, this is the only one that I have in my, my collection, but it's an interesting uh, cameo ad from the New York and Erie uh, Railroad, um, which was set up back back in 1832. And actually by this point in time when this cover was sent pretty much uh, spanned the entire state of state of New York. I'd love to find some more stampless uh, uh, era covers like this that have got ads and I continue to, uh, to search various places to see if I can find one. Um, the highlights in early post office history though, these are really ones that, that I find very fascinating. So the first one is from the issue of 1851 to 1857. Um, this, was, uh, this was the series of stamps that was issued uh, after Scott One and Scott Two in 1847. Uh, these stamps were issued to deal, to, uh, to pay the new three cent rate that went into effect on that particular date. And this particular stamp, as I mentioned in the title, is probably the most extensively studied stamp uh, ever. Uh, there are entire websites out there, uh, including the U.S. Philatelic Classic Society, which has entire pages dedicated to this particular stamp and all its plating variations. Um, it's a fascinating topic if you're into looking at details of the stamps based on, you know, how the diamonds are positioned, uh, various recuts on the design. This particular uh, stamp has been plated uh, to the 73rd position of the right-hand side of a plate of 200. Uh, pretty fascinating stuff. I actually tried my hand at plating it. I was off by a, by a few, and I had some people on the stamp community forum uh, help, uh, help nail down the actual uh, uh, plating of this. But this is one example of a, of a pretty interesting stamp from, from this early point in time. Uh, the next big change, of course, in U.S. postal history was the first perforated stamps. And this cover from 1859 from uh, Concord, New Hampshire, is franked with one of those stamps. So actually, two of them. It's not, it's, it's not a pair. Uh, this is the uh, same design from the 1851 and perforated series. Uh, they were printed from the same plates, so they were just perforated. And there were some uh, recuts made to, uh, to accommodate the, uh, the perforations, which is why the perforations tend to be almost right on top of the design in most cases. Uh, this is a very common stamp as well, and you can find, find many, many uh, covers out there with this particular stamp. This has got a great embossed ad on the back flap of this cover for a, for a piano manufacturer. Actually, as I mentioned here in this, this slide, they were one of the earliest piano, piano manufacturers in the U.S., and they built uh, pianos all the way up until the mid-1980s in the Boston area. The next slide on here is uh, something that, uh, that the post office came up with right after the Civil War. Uh, there was considerable concern that people were going to reuse stamps. Uh, and so the post office uh, tried to figure out a way to present or prevent fraud from, from occurring. And their idea that came up was actually to grill the stamps, press uh, an embossment into the stamp itself that would weaken the fibers of the stamp 
So when the cancellation was applied, if somebody tried to wash that neck cancellation or remove the stamp from, from the cover and reuse it, the stamp would, would, would fall apart. Um, that experiment ended in 1875. Uh, most studies concluded that the perception of uh, fraud was greatly exaggerated and, and the stamps uh, that were uh, grilled ended up being quite weak and so people got frustrated using them. Uh, this is a, a very common, actually the most common grilled stamp, uh, Scott 94. And you can see I tried to, to highlight the, uh, the grill there. It's very difficult to, to photograph it, but I think I've got a pretty decent job of demonstrating the, the grill on this particular thing. Um, and there's some great rarities among, among the grilled stamps uh, that, uh, that obviously are way outside my, my, my range of affordability, but are, are fascinating to collect. Uh, this particular ad too is, is kind of interesting. I was looking at trying to figure out what a new American heat regulator was. And I couldn't figure out if it was a water bottle or if it was some sort of early version of a furnace. And after I did a little poking around, it turns out that it's uh, basically a damper for, for a fireplace. Um, and this guy, guy invented and he, you can find so many covers of his out there. He was trying to drum up people to, to sell his particular product throughout the country. Uh, and I'm not sure how successful he was, but uh, but he certainly put a lot of time and money into into promoting his particular product. Um, this is a cover with one of the first pictorial stamps. So up until uh, 1869, all the all the U.S. stamps pictured, uh, you know, Franklin or I'm sorry, Franklin, Franklin or Washington, uh, uh, Lincoln, Jefferson, so forth. In 1869, they came up with the idea of having pictorial stamps. And this is an interesting one that actually uh, was used to Frank, uh, uh, an advertising cover that was sent to, uh, to England in 1869. Um, and these stamps did not last long. Uh, they, were, they were small, they were difficult to use. Uh, the glue was not very good, so they didn't stick very well. And so the U.S. Uh, poster, post office went on to the next set of issues, which I'll talk about in a, in a, in a moment. Um, and then the last highlight from from the uh, from post office highlights is the, of course, the issue of the first commemorative U.S. stamp, and uh, those were uh, the uh, Columbus Exposition stamps of 1893, uh, celebrating Columbus's discovery of America. Um, this one has got a connection to Philadelphia. That this particular uh, ad cover, uh, Aaron Sons, uh, as you probably know if you're from the Philly area, was a was a longtime advertising firm in the Philly area known for several very famous, famous ad slogans. Uh, the other thing to note about the, this cover, and I'll talk about the, 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 some of the, these cancellations in a moment. Uh, this is one of the earliest machine cancellations in this presentation. This was actually produced by a machine sold by the Universal Stamping Machine Company of New York. And there were a number of companies that popped up in the US in, in, the, in the kind of late 1800s uh, that, that produced a cancellation machine so that uh, Postal course could, could move away from having to do uh, hand stamps, um, both the postmarks and the uh, and the cancellation marks itself. So going on to the workhorse stamps of the 19th century, this is an area that again, if you're looking for opportunities to collect varieties, this is the place to go. Um, the um, the three cent design from the series of 1861 is the first of what I would call the workhorse stamps. You'll see this on a lot of Civil War covers. Uh, over almost two billion of this particular uh, stamp stamp issued. Uh, this is a nice cover with a nice uh, cameo cover from a tannery operation out of Pittsburgh, and actually was one of the longest lasting tanneries in the in the Pittsburgh area. And the stamp on this cover, which I've rotated here for you, is a is a nice copy with uh, with uh, with an imprint, uh, with a nice nice little feature of it. But again, this is a great stamp to to find lots of covers. And again, if you're into Civil War covers, this is the stamp you want to look for on those particular covers. Um, it came in a couple couple varieties. Um, this is one that has the, the pink variety, and I'll tell you, if it weren't for the uh, for the Philatelic Foundation certificate on this, I'm not sure I could distinguish a, a pink version of the three cent from, from the series of 1861 versus the rose color and some of the other colors. Uh, to be perfectly honest, when I look at the stamp, I can sort of see pink. I can probably make myself believe I see pink, but I really, really am not convinced that I can. But it's an interesting cover just because of, again, the ad cover fully illustrated. Uh, both both the front and the back had, had this cover, cover for the uh, Folly Seminary. And obviously it doesn't sound too bad right now to pay uh, 30, you know, less than 30 bucks for, for a term of 14 weeks for a uh, 
for both food and, and, and tuition. Um, this is another uh, example of a, of, a, of a cameo cover with a couple of stamps from the series of 1861. It has the, uh, the three cent issue as well as the, the 12 cent issue. And this is a great example of a, of a cover sent overseas and, and how you can dig into the details on the postal history of these particular items. Uh, this stamp, uh, this cover has a total of, uh, of uh, um, 15 cents of postage paid on it. And that postage would have covered the 3% uh, the rate from, from Baltimore to New York. So the, so the US Post Office got its share of it. And then seven cents of this postage went to the, uh, to the uh, transatlantic journey, the, the shipping company that, that took this across the Atlantic Ocean. And then five cents went to the, uh, to the, uh, to the German post office or the greater, I think it was the greater Australian, greater Australia, greater Austria postal union or German Austria postal union that that would have delivered this. Um, interesting markings on this again, on the very front, you can see just below the stamps a circular uh, marking there, that's a, that's a New York American packet marking, which is crediting the, the seven cents of the postage paid to the transatlantic journey. You got the auction Franco mark there, which would show that this went through that particular exchange office uh, right on the uh, border of France and, and Germany. And then on the back of the cover, you've got the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the postmark on the back from, from Malay Germany showing that the cover was, was received there on January 15th, 1863. So it took just, uh, oh, just, just roughly a, 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 a two, two and a half weeks for this letter to travel across the country. But again, a, a great example of the use of a couple of postage stamps in the series of 1861 and some pretty neat transit markings as well, and including the, the very nice cameo ad in the upper left-hand corner. Um, another workhorse stamp, and this is one that I just have two examples from, a corner card from, from New Orleans, from a, from a mule um, operation, actually part of the mule district in New Orleans, which was a huge industry down there after the, uh, after the Civil War. These, this is the banknote issue, uh, printed by, by three different companies between 1870 and roughly 1888, uh, six and a half billion of the stamp were printed and you'll find them with grills, without grills. You're gonna find some with secret marks, without secret marks when they were printed by, by different companies, the same design, but printed by different companies. So they, so they had a, uh, attached a, a little mark on it to differentiate the two. And then you'll also find them on different paper. Um, and this particular example on this page here is from, from the very first uh, national banknote printing from 1870, 71. You can see it has no secret mark, and you'll see what I mean on that on the next slide. And again, you can see the grill pretty obvious on this one in the picture to the far right. This is uh, the, the same stamp design, but this one is from 1875. And if you look on the lower uh, left-hand corner of the stamp, you'll see a little blue circle there. And you can see those ribbons under the word three are heavily shadowed. And that was part of part of the secret mark. I'll flip back and you won't see that below the three on this stamp here. So that was the, the, the type of thing that the second of the Continental Banknote Company did to differentiate its printing, printings of the same stamp design from the, from the, from the National Banknote Note Company. And you'll see different secret marks on different stamps. What I like about this cover, it's kind of a, kind of a raggedy cover, not all my covers are in great shape, but the T.W. Harvey and Company, uh, he was instrumental in rebuilding housing in Chicago uh, after the great fire there. So it's, it, I find it neat to have, I have a stamp. I lived in Chicago for about a dozen years. So it's kind of neat to have, have, uh, have a cover, you know, showing uh, evidence of this guy that did all this great work uh, just, just four years prior to him setting this particular cover out. Uh, another workhorse stamp is this uh, series from, from 1883, the Tucson, Washington. Um, this was a huge change in postal history. This is when the first class rates were cut from three cents to two cents per half ounce. It led to the issuance of this particular stamp. Uh, something like 4.5 billion of the stamp were issued. And it's really a favor for collectors who are looking for plate varieties, for cancellation varieties, particularly fancy cancellations. Um, what I like about this cover, again, it's not the greatest cover in, in condition, but this cover was uh, postmarked on October 18th, 1883. The stamp was issued on October 1st, 1883. So that's a relatively early usage of, of this particular, particular stamp. Uh, the next one here I, I included uh, because of the, of the postmark uh, and the cancellation. And this is an example of the cancellation varieties. You 
you can find. This is what was canceled with, with a barred elliptical cancel, which was invented by John Goldsberry from, from here in, in Philadelphia in 1875. Um, and it's a it's a very simple device that you'll see on the next page that that he that he created. It was basically a a single uh, handheld object, and one side of it was the uh, was the postmark that that would have the the city and, and the date and the state, and then the um, on, on the opposite side of it was a uh, was a was an oval electrical uh, killer cancellation, which which could be just be be a grid like that. And you'll find all sorts of varieties of this. Of this particular um, hand stamp that he that he sold, um, this is an example, probably a better struck version on the very same uh, stamp from Tucson, Washington, of 1883. Um, this one I like because of the of the uh, of the stamp on the left hand side where it says automatic telephone, all battery in central office. Uh, back at this point in time, when telephones were were starting to become installed in people's houses, the telephone company would actually go around and replace batteries in people's houses uh, because that's how the batteries are, that's how the phones were, were powered. The innovation in the late 1880s was the idea of having a central battery uh, that would power telephones throughout a particular city. And this was a big step forward by the, that actually was spearheaded by the Wallace Electric Telephone Company, uh, along with Royal Lee House, uh, who was the, uh, the recipient of this, of this particular letter. And then the last example I have of this uh, of this Washington two cent uh, from 1883, it's this particular one, uh, which does have, if you call it a fancy uh, cancel with, with a Maltese cross. Uh, but I like this cover just because if you're in, into, into ships, it's great. Uh, it's got this neat illustration on the cover itself. And then oftentimes in ad covers, uh, you will find enclosures. And this particular one actually had a letter uh, sent by the Robert Palmer Company to to one of his clients uh, with with a real striking um, uh, letterhead on the on the enclosure itself. So that's a nice little feature that that one can find. So kind of jumping ahead into classes other than than first class again. If you're into airmail, lots of examples out there of airmail, and this is something again if airmail collectors uh, you know could could help everyone understand the airmail rates that that, that took place uh, between 1918 and the in the late 1920s in this country would be great uh, because the rates seem to be constantly changing and adjusting. But this particular cover was sent to air mail from, from Salt Lake City to New York City uh, in October of 1926. Probably took a full day to get there, roughly, roughly 25 hours to, to arrive there. Um, and this is an example, and I'll show you in the next slide, of, uh, of kind of how you can dig into to some of the pulse of history of these covers. So for those of you that are airmail stamp collectors in the U.S., you probably have uh, seen these airmail route maps. This is the map from January 1st of 1926. It uh, shows the transcontinental route that the post office, the office flew, and it had three zones, right? So for every zone that a letter flew, it was charged at this point in time, eight cents of postage. Uh, so from San Francisco to Cheyenne, Wyoming was one zone. Cheyenne to Chicago was the second zone. And then Chicago to New York was the last. So since this letter uh, traveled from, from Salt Lake City to New York City, it traveled in all three zones, and thus was charged the equivalent of uh, 24 cents of postage, which was a pretty steep uh, steep price to pay at that, that particular time. Um, also an example of how you can dig into the postal bulletins, right? There, there were actually regulations governing uh, how these uh, how these envelopes could look to be used uh, through, through the airmail system. And, uh, and the color scheme on this particular envelope, if I go back, uh, red, white, and blue, was actually something that, that was permitted under regulations 1924. And it turns out in 1926, they decided to, to flip the, the red and blue stripes uh, for whatever reason, uh, but they still let the old envelopes go through. So lots of little arcane facts that one can dig up there. Uh, another example of, of mail class, third class mail. Uh, this is an illustrated cover or what some people might refer to as a billboard cover. A great example from, from a stamp dealer um, with a one and a half cent uh, uh, third class rate on this particular cover. Uh, Pre-cancel, again, from, from Little Rock, Arkansas with, uh, with, uh, with the back of the envelope showing how you get these great deals for, for 20 cents or 35 cents. Uh, from all these uh, countries throughout the world. So I still remember some of those countries from when I started to, to collect stamps. Uh, special delivery is another area. And this, this is an interesting cover uh, that this uh, company, George E. Howard and Company, spent uh, 
10 extra cents to have this particular letter uh, delivered uh, uh, special to the recipient in New York City. And if you look on the back of the envelope, there's a stamp that said that the special delivery stamp basically gives uh, the uh, immediate delivery, but it's only one time. And, and if it fails to be able to, to, to delivered immediately, then it's taken back and it's treated as regular first class mail. Well, this particular letter traveled from Washington, D.C. to New York City. Uh, uh, it basically, in one day, April 3rd, got there. And the post office tried to deliver this particular letter at 7, 10 a.m. in the morning to this business. And uh, I'm not sure many businesses even that day were open at 7 o'clock in the morning. It's certainly not a, not a company that, that sold paper. Post office couldn't deliver it, took it back, and just dealt with it as regular first-class mail. I also like the, the special uh, delivery stamps are from that era. They're very, uh, very nice looking stamps. They're very sharp, give you a real sense of what the post office was trying to do back then. Stamped envelopes, another great area. Um, this is a Wells Fargo wagon is a common, right? Um, a Wells Fargo ran its own private postal system back in the 1850s up until the 1890s. Customers would pay, in this case, 10 cents for this particular envelope which would include the, uh, the three cent franc for, for the US post office. And then they'd pay the, the extra seven cents to get the, uh, get the letter delivered uh, rapidly by Wells Fargo and company. The interesting thing about, uh, about stamped envelopes, uh, most of the stamped envelopes are printed on watermark paper. And unlike uh, trying to find a, a watermark on a stamp, uh, the watermark on, on these stamped envelopes is very easy to find just by putting them up to a, to a lamp and snapping a picture of it. Um, this is another example. This is one of the, I think, the, the cover that I actually put on your website uh, announcing my, my talk here. But uh, again, an example of, 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 a, of a postmarked um, cover from, from Minneapolis, St. Paul. I love the illustration, but by the way, if you could take a look at this uh, later, just zoom in on it. Very detailed in terms of these animals tailoring, tra tailoring clothes. But again, you know, watermark on this particular stamped envelope. Uh, postal and postcards, another area that, that one can dig into. Uh, the distinction, of course, a postal card uh, in uh, the world of stamp collecting is a card that's actually uh, uh, sold by the government, a post office that has the uh, the postage affixed to it. This one is a cover from from 1882 uh, from a uh, uh, some uh, outfit called the St. Louis Wood Pump Company, and I was wondering what a wood pump was, and did some research on it, and they were literally pumps made with wooden pipes that went into the ground, so they would. They would put four logs together, uh, bolt them together, and then they would use an auger to, to drill a hole through that, through that length of that, of that, of that uh, square board. And that would become the pipe that they would put into the ground and then they'd stick a pump on top of it and uh, pump water out. Very popular pumps uh, throughout the uh, uh, latter part of the 19th century into the early 20th century. Uh, postcards, of course, are different. You know, postcards are not cards sold by the by the uh, by the post office. Uh, neat thing about this postcard from from 1901 is that it's got a a, a cancellation and a postmark from a dead or a discontinued post office. And there's a whole uh, inventory that one can go through in a collecting specialty of just trying to find postmarks from from uh, post offices that that shut down. Uh, this one was from. Uh, was from a post office that that operated for just about 80 years from 1882 to 1964. Uh, something that I didn't know until I researched this is that um, even though postal cards were available well before 1898, if you were to send a postcard, uh, it would cost you the same uh, first class letter rate. And it wasn't until 1898 that the, that the um, uh, regulations were changed and allowed people to mail a postcard at the same rate that a postal card could, could be mailed. The other thing on this particular one is the, um, um, as you can see at the top uh, left on the back of this card, it's got uh, the, the slogan, there's no place like home. I always thought that came from um, uh, Wizard of Oz, right? Don't be uh, hitting your heels together. But it turns out it's actually the last line from a song that was written uh, back in 1822. So uh, that shows my knowledge of, uh, of Wizard of Oz. Um, another example of advertising and case post stamps. These had a very short period of time. Uh, this is an example of, of one that uh, was issued by the uh, J.C. Iyer Company uh, in Lowell, Massachusetts. Again, this was at a point in time when during the Civil War, when, when there was a shortage of coins 
And what the what the government decided to do was to allow uh, companies to, in effect, um, issue their their coinage using post-it stamps. And this would be a, a penny, a one cent, a one cent stamp. The stamp was enclosed with with a brass backing where the company would, would put its um, its advertising in the back of it, and then the uh, the mica would be the uh, would be the the clear the clear piece. Um, I think there were like fifty thousand of these of these coins issued, so they're 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 not uncommon, but they're 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 kind of interesting to see, and to, and to, to see what they were advertising at that particular time. Uh, speaking of the Civil War Confederate states, um, you know here's here's a cover that that I acquired uh, from from eighteen sixty two from a, a book publisher uh, out of New York, but actually had an office in New Orleans. Um, Again, this has got, uh, got a great example of the, uh, of the first uh, Confederate-issued uh, regular postage stamp, five cent Jefferson David stamp. And I haven't been able to come up with the, the exact year uh, uh, on this. There, there's no year on this, but I'm pretty sure it was postmarked in January of 1862, uh, because later that, that year is when uh, the Confederacy increased uh, the postage rates from five cents to 10 cents for any distance that a letter traveled. And this particular letter from New Orleans to uh, to Meridian, Mississippi, prior to July first, would have only cost a nickel to send. So I'm pretty sure this was uh, this was postmarked on on uh, Jan in January of 1862. And then to go through wrap up, just to some other features that that one can find on ad covers, and again, variety of collecting possibilities. Um, again, lots and lots of varieties of post cancel and postmark varieties. Here's an example of a stamp collar. Uh, with the uh, with the uh, the red seal cycle enamels paint uh, uh, ad framing the stamp itself, and this has two uh, strikes from a Goldsboro bar elliptical cancel. And obviously, the the postal clerk uh, missed the first time, or maybe he hit it the first time and just decided to whack it a second time. Uh, but this has got two nice strikes of that of that particular uh, canceling device. Um, one of the machines that is, was very common in the late uh, 1800s was called the Berry Machine Cancel. And I haven't been able to find a photo of a Berry Machine anywhere. And if anyone knows of one, I would love to, I'd love to see it. I actually found his patent application. These, these, were, uh, these were developed by, by Mr. Berry that's shown there on the left. Uh, his patent uh, illustrations are very, very detailed, but I can't quite figure out how his machine worked. But you'll see lots of varieties of, 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 his, um, of his configurations. There were different uh, uh, shapes of postmarks as well as different types of, of killer cancellations on a stamp. So I'll just go through a few of those here. Uh, this is one from, the, from 1903 from Kansas City. This has got the rectangular uh, postmark uh, with, the, uh, with the horizontal line, line killer. Uh, one thing I haven't been able to figure out in this cover either, and you'll find these on a lot of ad covers from, from the late 1800s, early 1900s, is these very you know, grand images. You know, here's this lady holding this, this American flag and this image of the eagle. I'm not sure what any of that has to do with, with selling cattle, but I guess it really did, didn't matter. You just wanted to have a, a stunning image that, that would catch people's, people's attention. Here's another stamp collar uh, with, with a very machine cancel. And this one, unfortunately, the... Uh, the uh, the cover's reduced at right, but it has a there. There's a clown at the very top with a policeman to the to the right who's actually framing this this particular uh, stamp. You'll find a lot of these these covers that were uh, issued by the uh, 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 by the Milwaukee Semi Centennial Celebration from the state of Wisconsin. You'll see on the left hand side where companies could insert their name and just have a, have a common advertising advertising cover. This very machine cancel again is different. This, this one has the oval uh, postmark with the, with the slant diagonal line killer cancels. That's another example of that. Um, and by the way, you can see on this on this cover to the far left side, you'll, you'll once again see the Milwaukee City Hall, which this was uh, just uh, a few years after that, after that building was constructed and already then it was considered to be a, a marquee uh, building in, in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, anyone for, for a past blue ribbon? Um, this is a nice cover with uh, with the burying machine cancel again with uh, with an oval porous mark. This one with the horizontal killer lines. And the nice thing about this cover on the far right, you'll see that I've, I've highlighted or zoomed in on the on the pin impressions. One of the features of the burying machine is they would actually um, drive pins into the cover 
to pull the cover into the machine to apply the uh, the killer cancellation and the, and the postmark itself. And so this, you know, that that is a that is a, a, a very typical impression uh, that you, that you'll find on a very machine cancel cover. And this one comes out nice, nice and clear about that. Uh, this particular envelope had, had an enclosure too, which I think was completely unrelated to, to, to the cover. Uh, the uh, the cover was sent in 1900, but inside the envelope was a 16-page uh, invitation that was handed out at the 1893 Columbian Exposition for for uh, for to visit uh, Milwaukee and to visit the the Pabst Brewery. Um, some of the images in this are just are just precious. Uh, you know, they talk about you know, beer, how beer could be a tonic and help you. It was for it was for the rich. It was for the working man, um, and so it was quite quite an elaborate uh, ad to get people to uh, to travel the ninety miles north to visit Milwaukee. I have no idea how many actually did, but uh, it's pretty. It was a pretty impressive ad, nonetheless. Uh, here's an example of a cross promotion cover a company called Wilbur Stock. Who is uh, also promoting Pabst Brewing Company, and this is another example. There's this is an uh, international uh, machine cancel from from Milwaukee. Again, a very very common uh, machine that was used in the in the late nineteen or early nineteen hundreds. And this cover's got one of the uh, the uh, the Washington Franklin definitives on. Actually, this was the first uh, one of the Washington Franklin definitives that was issued. And this is a another great collecting area if you want to dive into into something. A whole variety of of different perforations, watermark, unwatermark. You got single line, double line watermarks. Really fascinating area to dive into, and lots of stamps to to go through, including some some quite uh, quite difficult to to acquire stamps. Um, here's an ad cover with another international machine cancel uh, for for a washing machine uh, ringer. I'm sure some of you that are of a certain age remember uh, ringers on top of washing machines in your parents' basement. Uh, this one had had three. Uh, Three enclosures, one of them which I'm showing here, but the, the lady in that picture does not look too thrilled to be uh, to be holding this this particular ringer. But uh, it was uh, must have been been quite the quite the product to have in your house at the time. Um, here's another great example of a postal machine cover from the American Postal Machine. Uh, they were known for the spread field flag cancellations. Uh, they first started to appear in the late 1880s in, in Boston, and you'll find covers with this particular cancellation all the way through the, the Second World War. Um, this, this cover, too, interesting story about this hardware store. Uh, this was the hardware store that actually coined uh, the, uh, the name True Value, and they ended up selling that particular business as well as the, the brand out in 19, 1962, but it came from this Hibbert Spencer Bartlett and Company hardware outfit in Chicago. Here's another couple examples of uh, spread flag uh, uh, cancellation variants. In this particular case, you'll notice the postmark, the year is separate. So you'll find, again, um, American Pulse Machine cancellations where, where, where the year is uh, four digits straight across and some that, that are separated uh, into, into two separate sets of digits. Uh, the cover on the right side, the Woonsocket Shuttle Company, What's impressive about this cover, and unfortunately you can't see it from, from the screen, but not only is it fully illustrated, but the cover itself is embossed. So all those letters, Woonsocket shuttle, shuttles, Woonsocket, Rhode Island, all of those pop out out of the cover itself. So I would imagine that was a pretty pricey uh, cover uh, to, to produce and, and send out. So obviously a lot of money went into promoting these products. Um, another example of collecting possibility is private perforations. You know, there was a period of time in the early 1900s where, uh, where there were companies out there producing vending machines that they would put in uh, hotels and, and, uh, and drugstores, etc. And the Bureau of Printing and, and Engraving would actually give, uh, give these, these companies and perforated sheets so they could stick into their, their machines and you do their own perforations on them. This is an example of a Shermac machine that was uh, produced out of Detroit. Uh, this cover has got, if you notice, it's got the $1.75 stamped on the front. On the back of the cover, it's got a bunch of other stamps from, from different uh, of different denominations. And I was trying to figure out what those meant. And my best guess, it was probably a kid that did it. Uh, this letter was mailed to a very small store in a very small town in Illinois. And I can just imagine a kid, I used to do this, you know, whenever I found a hand stamp, I'd just smash it all over the place and see what I could, I could do on the back of a of an envelope or a cover. So that's my guess of what this juvenile delinquent was doing. Um, another example of a privately perforated stamp, this one uh, by, by another machine um, 
called the Mailometer, which actually was a spinoff of, of the Shermac machine company. Again, if you're a topical collector, great example of one with, with a ship and banking. And they even found a, a photo from, from 1914 of this National Bank of Commerce in, in St. Louis. And that's the building that this cover was mailed from. So it's a nice little connection there. Uh, getting close to the end here. So Cinderella is another area. I don't collect Cinderella's, but the Cinderella stamps, you know, they're Things you'll find on postal items that were not valid for, for postage are probably Christmas seals are the best example of it. Uh, this is one that I found on a cover from, from, from 1939. And it was, a, it was a, uh, a label that was issued by the National One Cent Letter Postage Association, which was organized in 1913 and it pretty much folded by the mid 1920s and was trying to push for the return to the one cent uh, uh, letter rate. Um, I'm not sure why the sender was using it in 1939, but but I'm glad that uh, he or she did, so I could have a have a copy of this in, in my particular collection. So Cinderella is another great area to collect. Early usages. I'd love to see if I can find these. Uh, this is a cover actually from November 10th, 1917, which was less than uh, two weeks after the uh, the emergency rates went into effect on November 1st. So. I kind of like to, to find these if, if I can. I'd love to find one on the first day. I'm sure that they exist out there if I just keep hunting for it. Um, Perfins, again, another collecting area where there's a whole Perfin society out there. These were, you know, it either stands for perforated initials or perforated insignia, but they were, it was a way to prevent uh, employees from stealing stamps from, from, from their company. So they put these little, uh, little uh, uh, dotted uh, letters into the stamp and then apply them. This is one from, from the Kansas City Journal. And sometimes these are hard to, to see unless you look. Um, and in this particular case, I just took a took an image of the stamp and turned it into black and white, and I was able to outline the letters. And there's a whole catalog out there that the uh, uh, that the Perfin Society has where you can go through and you, you can find all the various examples of them. And there's literally thousands of, of Perfin's examples out there. It's another great collecting area. Postage due, if you like that, you know, here's one that was sent uh, Back because it was a third class letter and it didn't, uh, it was not deliverable. So it got slapped with a one cent uh, postage due and it was returned to the sender in Boston back in 1895. Um, registered mail um, got another interesting example uh, that, that you can collect. This cover I, I like because it really shows the way uh, registered mail was supposed to be handled by the post office, which is where the, the stamps had an undated. Uh, cancellation itself, which forced the postal workers to look for the back of the envelope to make sure it was not tampered with. So as you can see, there's a there's a double oval on, on top of the stamp. And then you can see the uh, the postmarks on the back that actually show when this uh, letter departed and uh, to make sure it was not, was not tampered with. But what I love about this particular cover from the Sweet Manufacturing Company is it was sent to Daniel F. Keller. Uh, uh, of Keller um, Auction House at the time that they were located at 7 Water Street in Boston. So it's a neat little cover to have. Uh, and this is the last example of registered mail cover. This, this, I guess, is a corner card, but I just love it. Uh, at one time, you know, commercial banks would actually mail cash back to the Federal Reserve Banks. Um, and this this uh, bag cover came from, from 1964, was mailed from uh, from uh, uh, North, far northern Maine, actually right on the border with Nova Scotia, uh, down to the Federal Reserve Bank of, uh, of Boston. It's from the Northern National Bank of Presque Isle. And uh, it's got $14.95 worth of postage. And I kind of did some research on it. I was wondering what that five cent stamp down there was. Well, it turns out, you know, you could not mail <clears throat> something registered mail unless they had a first class letter rate. So a, a nickel stamp was applied to, to make, uh, to, to satisfy the first class letter rate. And it's got five dollars and sixty cents to pay the indemnification for the twenty four thousand five hundred dollars of cash that was in this bag, and then they had to obviously cover the weight of above eleven pounds to to get this bag sent down to Boston. So not strictly an ad cover, but I, I thought it was kind of a neat little piece. So conclusion to wrap up: what's missing? Lots, I'm sure. Right? I haven't I haven't even touched uh, every every possible example of what you could find. I'm sure in the ad cover. Uh, two areas that, that I'd love to love to fill my my collection with are a couple of ad covers with uh, Postmaster Provisional. My guess is that I will never have one of those in my collection. Uh, I went on to the uh, USPCS census, and there's only a single recorded example uh, of an advertising cover that's got a uh, 
a New York provisional on it. And I don't think it has been in the market since the late 1940s. Uh, Scott 1 and 2, of course, the first uh, stamps issued by the, uh, by the post office in 1847. That's a little less rare, but still only 70 copies out of, uh, of 16,000. I'm not sure I'll ever have uh, one of those in my collection as well, but I'll continue to, uh, to dig into that. So to wrap up, um, concluding thoughts, I think ad covers are a great collectible in their own right, uh, but they can really be special when you find some philatelic features. And it, this, this whole exercise that I went through just demonstrates to me how many permutations there is to stamp collecting. And it's, and it's pretty tough to get bored. And if you get bored, just, uh, just take take a step back and, and look for some angle to go in, and I'm sure you're going to find something to to, to enjoy. Um, and then the last slide on here, which you can look at at, at your leisure, I just uh, listed out some, some resources that I use for this particular presentation. And again, lots of great information at all these um, at all of these uh, websites and books if you want to dig into some of it. So. That wraps up my spiel. I hope you've enjoyed it. I uh, hope I didn't run too long, but let me see if I can un... Hey, can we get a phenomenal round of applause for Mike? Because But he did not disappoint this evening, sir. You definitely <laughs> well, covered you. all the bases. Uh, definitely a round of applause, and we appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Let's open it up to the floor. Yeah. And uh, just a reminder, this will be on our website in a little bit, because you know I'm going to post it. Uh, and we'll get that out to your presentation eventually in a couple of weeks. It'll be on the YouTube channel as well. But let's see if Mike, uh, any questions are, are here from Mike Wilson, please. Yep. Mike, um, several of those covers were addressed, look like they were typewritten. Were they done with typewriters or like an addressograph? I'm thinking it was something commercial, the fact that they were commercial covers and sent in mass. Yeah, I imagine they, they probably were, especially some of some of the third class letters, I would imagine yeah. would have been done that way. Um, you know, I, and I, there was that one, the washing machine um, one, uh, that one actually did the, the enclosures in it were a series of, um, of, of ads that, 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 a, that a store could use. And so, you know, that kind of thing I'm sure got, but that's a good question. I, I'm not sure how they would have, how would have, they would have pushed those out. So mm -hmm. some look into. Mm -hmm. Mike, I'm not going to tell you I have some stamp lists that you might like in Boston. We'll talk about that separately. I know you were looking. Yeah, for that'd be good. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know you were looking for those. Same for the three centers. You know, I got a couple thousand of those babies laying. Around. I know you do. <laughs> I have a question though for you on that early cover you showed about Milwaukee and the city and the airmail, and on the back of it was the image and aerial view of Milwaukee. Is was that printed on? That's not tipped onto that cover added after is that actually printed on that uh, no, that was image? actually it was actually printed I mean, the whole cover uh was yeah was it was a it was a um like a tourist postcard that that you would buy if you went someplace and yeah so that was that was printed as as part of part of the cover itself so as the message place on that card was just at that small little place just to the to the left of the uh, of the stamp itself. Yeah. If I recall, it was what Northwest Airways Inc. So that was a yeah. promo for them, right? Okay. Good. Right. It was. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that. Thank you. Any other questions, please? Mike. Yeah. You were you referred to Blair canceling uh carrying mail between from north to south. How did mail, how did letters and packages move between north and south? During the Civil War? Yeah. Yeah, very, very difficult, I think. Um, this particular cover actually was um, it was just mail from Louisiana to Mississippi. So it was a purely Confederate Confederate letter. Um, I believe there was a period of time shortly after the Civil War started where there was mail moving between between the north and the south. And then eventually Postmaster Blair General, you know, just shut everything down. So they demonetized the U.S. stamps so the Confederacy couldn't use them or, or try to uh, 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 cash those in. And then I believe they they just simply just cut off any kind of communication back and forth well, between between did, the two countries. How did divided families communicate? You know that I don't know. That I that I really don't know. I'm I'm not sure if they you know probably. I mean you you will find. I guess it's more prisoner of war mail. You'll find that running back and forth be, between between the north and south. And I'm not sure how families you know dealt with that, particularly if they were you know between say. Yeah, you know, right on the border states, you know, between, um, you know, Pennsylvania and Virginia or whatever. So, 
So, Walter, there's a quite a bit of info out there. I just proofed and we're reading uh, and, and we're publishing in the Chronicle a whole series on blockade runners. So there was ship mail that was still coming in and out of certain ports south to north as well. Um, and but you then also had Union blockade runners because uh, they were also trying to get, uh, uh, you know, shipments of food and armaments and whatnot also from other folks that were loyal that were uh, on various ships coming even from overseas, too. So there was a quite a bit of, of, of interesting movement throughout the south the gulf around the peninsula of florida then up the coast too and so you even had that not just inland and then you oh. also had mail that was trying to move up various rivers and whatnot so it was difficult what, but there's quite a bit of info in the csa website those, and a few other resources are a good place to look for kind of those details if you're and, and ron majors did you talk about that yeah, the, that yours? There were, yes, there were some private express Run. companies that actually would move the mail across the border and they had to go through an exchange office, mm -hmm. but it was very tough, uh, you know, sending mail uh, from the south to the north. And that's why the blockade runners made good business uh, through the they whole did. war. Of, they like, did, Canada. Ron. <laughs> did they use Canada at all like uh, the Allies did with uh, Switzerland and Scandinavian World War II, World War One? Well, you know, Canada actually uh, was reluctantly supporting the the Civil War because, you know, being a British colony, the British never formally uh, in, in, engaged or declared war against yeah. the, the Confederate States. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I'd love to find, I have one, uh, what's called an adversity cover from, from the Civil War. This is when the Black Cade was very effective. Paper supplies were very scarce in, in the South, so people would use whatever paper they had at their disposal, including taking wallpaper off of their houses and folding it and mailing it off. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if there's any uh, uh, wallpaper cover, advertising covers out there. So that'd be that'd be a combination. I think that'd be pretty pretty unique if I could find one of those. Hey, Ron, Mike is asking for almost the impossible, right? Because you know <laughs> we, we've got a couple of wallpaper covers, but I've never seen an advertisement. I, have not. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Unless you use some advertising brochure to construct an envelope. That's well, right. there you go. There you go. That may sound like a check out for so. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, if, uh, speak, have you ever exhibited this uh, collection of yours or have you ever thought about it? I mean, some beautiful covers in there and uh, nice themes. You could yeah, several, have several I've never, exhibits based on advertising covers. Yeah, I've never, I've never thought about that. Maybe that's something I, I should consider. So, yeah. I, I appreciate that. So, yeah, if anybody has any comments, again, as Charlie said, once he gets this this uh, slide deck posted up there, you know, I encourage you to go through it, and I welcome any any feedback you've got um, yeah, on Mike, it. So, Mike, this is Mike Bach. Hopefully, you're yeah. hearing me as Suzanne. Yes, I can. <laughs> I <laughs> can hear you, Mike. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking as as you did the presentation, this lends itself very much into topical in that you could pick an yeah. industry or farming or manufacturing or whatever and 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 develop go in in many different directions with this. Yeah, there, there really is. I mean, it's just, um, it's, yeah, especially when you talk about that. I mean, you could go to the American Topical Association checklist. Uh, you just kind of peruse that and you could find an ad cover or a set of ad covers that would that would uh, uh, match up with any one of those checklists. Yeah. Yeah. Now, maybe yeah. I'll think about it. I've, I've never done I've never done an exhibit. Um, I, uh, I I was uh, surprised to learn at one of the philatelic gathering meetings that in the entire U.S. there's only like 800 people that that, that exhibit on a regular basis. So that makes it seem like uh, there aren't there are that many out there. So maybe it's not uh, not too hard to join them. So. Well, Mike, you already have access to Bill Schultz, right? You know we have access to Bill Schultz, right? And yeah, he's yeah, more, more than happy to, to work with you and lay that out. So, yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I see Peter has a similar collection. So yes. Love to compare notes. Yeah, yep. Peter, glad you reached out today and glad we were able to get you the invite so you could join us. Thank you so much for getting online. Any other questions for Mike? This was, you know, I, Mike, we, you uh, could have taken two hours, Mike. There is no time. Yeah, I know. I kind of had to run through that. So <laughs> I want to make sure you have box some time. Yeah, I do have one other question on the flag, on the wavy flag cancels. Yeah. They had there were several with letters in the middle of the cancel. Does that signify anything particular? Yeah, those those were usually applied. I think to like indicate maybe maybe the post office. In some cases, it could be the the clerk that was working at that particular okay. time in the office. 
yeah so some okay. some identification uh, to, to identify who was doing the work yeah yeah the same question i saw like it, there's one with a two on it and and so yeah. on yeah yeah, yeah. some yeah. with an e yeah, yeah. A right and together. some some will have those the little die spaces and some won't and uh um and i think it all depends on again how they uh who's using it and what kind of identification they wanted to put in Mark, if you want, I'll send a copy of this one on to you. Let's see if I can do it from Philadelphia. It's an oh, envelope, yeah. envelope advertising from Philly with the full advertisement on the front. Yeah, I thank you, Jim. Can... That's a great piece. I know. Send a scan to yeah. Mike. He'd love to see yeah. that. Jim, great. I'll send I'll send you Mike's address. Yeah. And Charlie, I'll that. get around to sending the whole medical uh topical. Yeah. Envelope collection to you, Jim. You know where I live. You know I can take a peek at that for you. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I got a couple articles coming out. You know, in the next next month's Chronicle and the next American Revenue is so a few articles coming out on all those topics. Yeah, appreciate. And I'll use the scanner. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions for Mike before you know we kind of Mike? You got a lot of Q and A. This is just this covers so many topics, mm -hmm. so many areas. There is something in here for everybody which is yeah. which is That's really what I was kind of open for yeah yeah and any other questions uh, there is a different one here which i don't think you've touched uh let's see if i can find it okay oh, is that a revenue revenue it's a revenue right yep. yeah excellent it's on the advertisement piece do you want to copy yeah. that too sure i'd love to have that yeah i've got a couple of revenues on on, on bank uh, checks itself but uh I'm not sure. I guess I could consider those ads if I wanted to stretch yeah, that. There, stretch. there was three good Mike. business houses of Hartford. Okay. Yeah, Jim, definitely yeah. send that over. That would be that yeah. would be great. Yeah, I, I I meant to get to it and I didn't. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Any any other quest? Please let's let's. We got Mike in front of us. Please uh, ask away. And that's your mm -hmm. medical. That's your medical book, Charlie. All right, good. Thank you, sir. I'm ready. <laughs> Do you know anything about uh, who it was that sent or received the ZCMI airmail cover from Salt Lake City? Uh, sometimes the receivers or more often the senders can be a, a big factor from Utah. Right. I'm trying to, I believe, I don't want to, I got to call this up on another uh, screen here. You're talking I about the ZMC, that, yeah, the ZCMI cover on slide 31. Yeah, right? yeah, I'm 31, looking at that. Yeah, yep. yeah, yep. that was that was yes, the Hess Gold Goldsmith and Company was a um, was a retailer in New York City, and I I did some some background. I think they were either a um, like a high end clothing store or something like that. So uh, I'm not sure if again if the ZCMI, which was a big retail outfit in Salt Lake City, so I'm not sure if they were sending to Hess Goldsmith and Company looking for something to sell at their store or vice versa. But yeah, Bill, thanks for joining us too tonight. We got a lot of good folks on and guests. I'm glad you know, folks reached out through like posted on Facebook, Mike, and here we go. I'm just sending That's out the, email, the link, which is great. I I'm so glad we can share this great work far and wide uh, with all of our friends and members and guests. So anything else for Mike while we got him? Hey, how about another round of applause for Mike? Because I got to tell you, that's just Thank fantastic. You. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mike, I'll see you in February at the gathering. I think I'm kicking off uh, with a whole a whole section on U.S. private diaper proprietary revenues and a little show and tell on their original packages. So hopefully you can get on down for that and anybody else that wants to join us at the Chester County History Center as we kick off the new year. And just a reminder, too, we have our next meeting in January 10th, and that will be a society auction. So if you want to come on down, we'd love to have you for that as well. If you're a member, please do. Um, we have a Paul, lot of nice, turn it back to you, of nice donations yeah, uh, please. going on the block. Yep. Hey, I one see some I, I, I want to say one quick thing. I have, say have, I have 15 thing. albums. Yeah of the Commemorative Society first day yeah. covers and another five albums on the uh, U.S. Bicentennial. Yeah, but uh, also, I'll work on that privately. <laughs> so definitely coming out. I want to thank Samil Betinoff too. I know he's here from the EFO Society and uh, the Collectors Club. I want to thank him for publishing another article of mine in the last issue, my friend. That was 
very nice of you, and I'm glad we were able to work on that together. And thank you very and, much and, for and, that. It was yeah. great, uh, Charlie. It's what it's, it's it was a great collaboration. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you again, Mike. Just thank you for that. Paul, I'll turn it over to you because we'll do some show and tell. Is that correct? Yeah. And again, just yeah. thank you, everybody. Thank I'll, you. I'll be here for a little bit until we get called. Uh, okay. I think Mike Bach, you have one you want to share with us? Yeah. Uh, show and tell. Uh, Very interesting from this morning. So, right and find it. Here we go. There we go. Well, you've Thank heard you. of LuftPost. Can see it, and... Mike. I'm sorry? We can see it. Okay, good. Uh, you've heard of uh, LuftPost, probably, which is in balloon post, but in my uh, Bundesfire, which is the national post office issue of cards in Switzerland, I stumbled on Segel Post. Now, how do I advance? Uh, which is Swiss Glider Airmail. So these are the two covers from my Bundesfire collection. So Bundesfire is the national holiday in Switzerland designated as August the 1st. And just a very brief outline, they, they issued one or more cards on August the 1st every year from about 1910 to 1960. And I've got about 82, 180 different cards and about 85 different designs. And I'm trying to work on doing a presentation of that later in 24. So uh, these are two examples. And so what was special about these on August the 31st, 1930, there was the second annual Swiss glider meet at Bachtel Mountain in Canton Zurich. So we'll give you a, a little idea where this was. So Zurich is up here and Bachtel Mountain is just southwest a little bit, right near the border of Canton St. Gall. And so at this glider meet, and this is Bachtel Mountain, and they hauled the gliders up there, and then they had a mechanism for kind of slingshotting them off the mountain. <laughs> Uh, back in the 1930s, a glider mail wasn't very sophisticated. It was uh, basically privately made gliders. And these uh, glider manufacturers came together for this uh, glider meet. Baxter Mountain is about 3,500 feet up, so it's decent height. So what happened is that they made arrangements with the Swiss post office to do a special cancel for three different flights. And uh, they went to, so the first one is the longest one, which went all the way up to a place called Aus Kilon, Aus Likon. And that was about 9.5 kilometers. The package of airmail cards we're in the air for about 11 minutes, 35 seconds, and Sparlinger S12 was the glider. Sparlinger was a glider manufacturer of his private in Germany. And um, he, he had different series as he modified them. It went up to, they made about 26 machines. There's only one in existence that was been rebuilt and flies today. The second, flight that carried mail went to Wetsikon, which was about seven kilometers or about an eight million, eight minutes, two second flight. Again, another, Down that's here. how you spelled it, spelling a S9, a diff, earlier type of his. And then the third one was a short distance down to four kilometers in the air for just short of four minutes. And this was an Austrian glider. So I those two covers that you saw both had a special red cancel of Schweitz Segel Luftpost on the date 
and Bachtel on the bottom. And this was a special council. And um, rather, I most of the mail was just addressed locally and delivered locally. But there are some others that are rather special. They all had different, uh, they used the airmail covers that were issued in nine, for the year. And, and the cover would have been issued on the 1st of August. So from that, I have two covers. The first one, this is a very nice cancel. Oops, sorry. And it's postmarked in the little town of Wetzikon. So that was the eight minute flight and in the Canton Zurich. And Schlieren is a suburb of, of Zurich. Um, you can find it on the map today. The second cover I have is rather special because not only did it um, does it designate it as the uh, glider Luftpost and the special cancel, but this one was taken and then it went to Auslikon, which was the furthest distance. From Auslikon, it was taken to the Zurich Flugplatz, and in 1930. Zurich didn't have an airport of its own. It was using the other side of a military airfield. And it's got a rather nice uh, Flugplatz cancel. And then it, would, it was addressed to Mettenhofstrasse in Bern. And this one has a uh, very nice Bern cancel as well. So. So this is a very special cover. I've never seen one. Well, these are the only two covers I've been able to obtain. And to have one that's got four very clear cancels on and looks like it was signed maybe by, um, I, I don't know who, I haven't been able to determine the name, whether he was the pilot or not. Um, could have been a postmaster in Auslikon, but I don't know. And so this is rather unique and I'm very happy to have it. <laughs> and then the address, I looked that up and, oh, sorry, just some high, higher definition of the, the different cancels, uh, the Auslikon, the Zurich Flugplatz and the Bern Luftpost. And then I did a look up and so it went from Bachtel to Zurich and then Zurich to Bern down here. And then I did a lookup and the address, this is the building that now exists for that address. Now, whether this was the building that was built in 1930, it could be. Um, it looks a pretty solid structure, but that's the address of where it arrived. So... Uh, that's my short um, show and tell on two rather unique uh, Bundesfire cards that I stumbled across and a, a unique uh, glider mail. So uh, if anybody has a question or, at all, I can... Questions for Mike? Hey, Mike, this is Mike Wilson. I'm just curious how you stumbled across these. Were you just on a show or did you see them online? Uh, no, I I um, actually have them book, uh, Bundesfire cards bookmarked on eBay. Oh. And, they, and they pop up. And I also have them on, um, what's the website in, in Belgium? Um, gosh. Anyway, I think I got these through the uh, the Belgium website. Mm -hmm. And the cards, the Bundesfire cards are far cheaper in buying them from a Belgium version of eBay mm -hmm. than, than over here. Um, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, they, they pop up on my, my feed from the two different uh, websites. And, Is that Dell uh, Camp? Sorry, Del Camp. Yes. Okay. That's it. Mike, I have a question. The the three covers with the icon ending. I would assume those are all. They have the icon ending because they're 
uh, glider fields because I've seen a lot of covers from there and I've never seen any with the ending or the name of the location, this icon. Well, that's that's just a local, um, there's lots of little towns in Canton, Zurich, in that area, which end in I-K-O-N. I oh, think okay. it's, so it's, I think oh, it's, it's more a local naming <laughs> um, concept. Um, I haven't really dug into the naming of the towns, but that's a nice, that's a thought going forward to figure feels out the to origin. Me like, feels to me like it's something like, you know, how we here, we have Ville, like Lakeville or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. So it seems to be some kind of, uh, you know, ending uh, that has some kind of meaning. I know a couple of other towns, like Erlikon, I think, was had in the years ago, uh, medicine manufacturer or something like that. So I've heard that too, that, that ending. Yep. Other questions? Bob Noble? I have a screen I want to try to share. Um, I'll look this. Okay, he has to turn his sharing off first. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay. And I hit share screen and I hit. Share. Okay. Another thing that you didn't mention that you could also do is you could get different envelopes from different periods from the same company. <clears throat> this is one I I have come up with. This is Champion Blower and Forge Company. It's from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, there's some different cancels here. There's a flag cancel there on the bottom. You can see how the envelope itself changed. Um, Here's another one from the same company. Ah, back. Ah. I'll go back. All right. This is another one from the from the company. Uh, <clears throat> they are beautiful covers. Uh, they they were a big company. I'm not sure if they're still in existence or not. So that's three. Now number four. <clears throat> this I, I've showed before. This is my pre cancel from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, Mike, we this, I have a blank screen. Showing. Yeah, you what? You're showing. Hit escape. What? Not turned. Hit escape. Okay. Yeah, nothing's showing on the screen right now. About now. Try hitting your escape key. Right, there's the no. escape go, key. Go back now, and share screen again. Hit share screen again and hit. That one. There you go. Okay, I can now see it. There you go. Um, 
instead of changing a slide, I'm gonna do it the other way. Um, this was the first one again, this is the second one. This third one, <clears throat> I've showed the item before because it's the um, pre-cancel from Lancaster. I kept, I've kept looking for this. And I, I think this is another category that he didn't mention. Uh, and that is <clears throat> advertising covers. But these are a little bit different. I managed to find a complete advertising cover from Champion Blower Forge on eBay uh, that is the complete thing. It, and it's a penny for this postage, which was the cost of uh, unsealed advertising sent through the US mail. So this guy right here, this was the outside of the envelope was folded. Trifold. Trifold. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is there's the, that's that part again. There's the inside of it, which is kind of interesting. It's the trifolds again. You can see yeah. the three folds. But now, on top of that, <clears throat> I have the catalog itself in there, all still attached. This is page 40 you're seeing here. This is like newsprint. And um, this is all mailed for one cent. cent. <laughs> one cent. Here's the... That's, there's that's that. very creative. Use. Very creative use of postage. And as I said, I think it's, I think this is a, a category that you, you yeah. didn't mention because besides this being just one company, it's also the use of a penny stamp for advertising. Yeah. 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 That's one of the things I've got to dig it. I, um, it's interesting when you go back and you look at the impetus for companies to put ads on their covers back in the 1850s, it really had to do with the cost of the paper. And people figured out that they could get a lot of mileage out of the paper that they were putting in the mail by just putting ads on it. And that became more and more elaborate. This is, this is a great example of that. And there's also, there were also, I noticed ad covers that you can find even from the 1850s that had one cent postage on them that were actually sent as ad mail itself. So there was a whole different category. Uh, I think must have been separate from third class, or maybe part part of third class. I've got to dig into that a little bit more. Those are those are more like newspaper wrappers, you know. People yeah. used to send yes, a lot of yes, a lot yes. of advertisement. <clears throat> Absolutely. Wrappers, right? yeah. And and it, yeah. one other interesting thing I found, which I don't have a picture of right here, is I have another one from another company. It's only like five pages or something like that. Interestingly enough, it was developed in Lancaster at Champion Blower Forge, which is the company that did this. So they evidently did it for some other people as well. So, Were they along Dillersville Pike going across the bridge? Yes. 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 Uh, out behind F&M now. This, yes. is, this, this is the pre-cancel, though, that they did. It looks like absolutely nothing. It's a purple blob. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. But uh, in any case, it still is a pre-cancel, which I'm very pleased at also. Yeah. Bob? Mm -hmm. Mike, uh, Bach, anything else on yours? or No, just uh, okay. the two... Uh, rather unique um, cards in a very extensive Bundesfire post 
card yeah. collection. So Very well, good. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, Bob. Anybody else have anything? Paul. Oh, yes. I have an, an addendum to a presentation I made a little while ago. Okay. Michelle. <laughs> I did a presentation on the six cent Filipino stamp of the regular issue of 1935. It was the United States of America, so it's found back a book, and it's a simple one color stamp. And then there were a whole set of stamps that were following it. They were overprinted. There was a 10 year span for that stamp. Sometimes the variation was just in color, dark brown and golden brown. Some was for official business. Some was to proclaim the Commonwealth as if it wasn't there already. And then the Japanese came in and they occupied the Philippines for a period of time. And they had their own overprints as well on all these stamps that you see pictured here. Now at our last sale, one of our club members came up to me and said, I forgot a stamp. And I did, rightfully so. I didn't have anything to, to show you. But that stamp looks like this. It's the same stamp, but it's overprinted in purple or violet with the word victory. There were many other issues, but this is the one here. And I thank Dave Hunt for sharing that with me because he has some in his collection, I think. And he shared with me some other EFOs of that same stamp. So you see the upper right, a Miss Perf, and you see in, in the middle bottom, a Miss Register of the OB. So what turned out, started out as a one page PowerPoint, ended up being four pages to get all this to work. <laughs> Almost like word wrap, all I gotta do is add it in and not start over, that's yeah. wonderful. George, are those uh, the victories, do they need to be expertized? Yes, for sure. Yeah. You can find some on eBay very cheap. Yep. There's some keys. This letter T has a bit notch in it. And yeah. it's got a slight curve to it. Uh huh. And it was printed on rollers on a sheet. I have another, I don't have it on this PowerPoint, but I have a copy of a sheet. And it was printed in exactly the same place. And then I have some samples from eBay that are pretty obvious fakes. Mm -hmm. Nice. Between that, that and the United States 11, uh, one could have a full career. <laughs> yes. Yeah, good. Well, I'll, yes. I will add to that that the victory overprints were and are still being forged, but some of the most pernicious ones were done by a Philippine dealer shortly after the war. He was well known as an expert in Philippine philately, and he used to act as an expertizer and would sign the backs of stamps that he declared genuine. So he decided himself to start making forgeries of the victory overprints and then signing them as being genuine. Nice. You know, it's hard to beat Yankee ingenuity, isn't it? <laughs> I guess being, you know, that country after being ravaged, people did anything they could, you know, to make a couple of bucks. But yeah, it's a little tough on the collector. They, they didn't Thank make the money the from the postage, but they made the money from the postage collectors. The yeah. Collectors. Mm -hmm. Well, the victory overprint 
the stamps were ones that had survived the occupation. Yes. Because uh, they were all printed prior to the Japanese occupation. That's right. And some were saved in post offices, some were secreted away somewhere because the Japanese tried to remove any evidence of that from the post offices. And in a tropical climate, when you tuck mm -hmm. things away in some secret location, they uh, sometimes all get stuck together. They don't fare too well. Mm -hmm. So most of them, you will find, they used to store them in the post offices with a glassine interleaving between the sheets so they wouldn't stick together. What you find now is <laughs> most all of them have the glassine stuck to the back. Yes. And if you find one that does not have glassine on the back but has perfect gum, then you should be very suspicious. Look at those perforations with the magnifying glass and you can, you can see. Very good. Well, thank you, gentlemen.